even. Um, the money for the uh, cubicle fund hasn't been coming in like I was hoping it was gonna, you know, and I, I promised you that, you know, you weren't gonna have to work as a mountain guide, but. I don't want to be a mountain guide. I want to work in a cubicle. So we'll give it, whatever, let's say six more months. Okay. All right. Uh, Mike Barter, everybody's favorite mountain guide, once again. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about crampons, okay? And, uh, but before I do that, I'd like to thank those people who made a donation. You really helped out, um, revamped our website. So, basically, if you want to find out what's going on with these climbing tools or what's coming around the corner, um, you can... See, we're kind of scripting on the go, and then probably a few weeks later you'll see the next show. But you get to see the script in advance and what materials we're using to uh, make this uh, flick. So, that holds true for this video too. So if you can go back, there's more supplemental information that goes with this uh, video. Yeah, well, honey. Now it's time to learn about crampons, okay? Essentially, there's two main types. There's rigid crampons, which have like no bend in them whatsoever, eh? So they got like a, a metal bar, so, and they have no flex in the crampon whatsoever. And then the other type of crampon is the uh, flexible crampon, right? And it has sort of a hinge in the middle, and it'll attach with, with different bail configurations, different setups. But uh, the important thing is that it's a better walking crampon than this. Now the other good compromise though, Avon, is something maybe like this uh, foot or saber tooth. I believe these are. And it's a bailed crampon, but it flexes in the, in the middle. But um, it attaches firmly enough to the boot and the bales are pronounced enough that you could climb pretty steep waterfall ice and extreme alpine ice and uh, still have a fairly comfortable walking crampon. Today I'm going to talk to you about crampons. So uh, if you're, you're, if this is your first set of crampons or you're looking to buy crampons, then you've got to decide what you're going to use them for, right? So let's assume that you're going to use them for waterfall ice climbing and technical mountaineering or uh, steep mountain. Well then, you're going to need a boot that's specific to that environment and so something like this this is a Kaland ice boot um, it's insulated it's pretty warm up to about minus 20 below that you know you shouldn't be ice climbing anyhow but if you are you're gonna need a gator for it um, I have froze my feet in one of these if you're a bit of a dinosaur back in the day this was uh, a double plastic boot and it has a removable liner in it Right, And the thing about these boots, you'll notice, is they have this pronounced welt on the front and on the very back. You can see when that? I was talking about those welts, what I'm talking about is these crampons have a design where you have a front bale that fits into those welts. Right? And then you have a back bale that hinges on your boot to snap that front bail so it's nice and tight. Now once that's put on, there's no movement between the boot and the crampon. And this is a full shank boot so it has no flex to it at all. And that gives you a really good platform to, for steep ice and, uh, and uh, you know, ext extremely steep alpine terrain. Um, the disadvantage of these are the small rails here will, on soft snow, uh, will pick up snow and then clog inside there. And so they have to be cleaned constantly and then sometimes they can get pressed in there so hard that uh, they're very difficult to clean, which is kind of a safety factor. Um, they have a safety strap on just about all of them that runs through the toe piece. And then has some sort of hookup. This, in this case, it's two rings.
and that's theoretically just to keep that front bale pulled up into place but it's really difficult for that front bale to come out anyhow and then if I got too much tail then I just slide it around tie a knot and just back off that rent those rings so that uh, makes it nice and secure Even. All of these marks that are in my uh, my old climbing pants on both legs, that's where the crampons, the front points caught, right? So when I'm walking, what I've got to do is be really careful about these front points and on my pants, because look at this, there's probably 50 wounds at least in these things, right? And uh, you have the, the... I you got some new ones? Well, I do got some new ones. I got some of these Arcarix ones. I bought them a little while ago. But even they, look at them. See, even there, they've still got some crampon wounds. Right? And that's from... I know what you're thinking. You're thinking I'm just clumsy, but... I'm not, actually. I'm pretty good. I was practically born with crampons on. And your grandma resented me for that ever since. So whenever you get in some place where there's a big long slope underneath you, right, move your points and you're wearing crampons, move your feet apart and kind of walk, you know, do, do what I call doing the duke or walk like John Wayne used to walk. Okay? on evolution according to Mike Barton. I'm here to tell you a story that goes back in time. Just give me a second, I want to make this puppy rhyme. Okay, you see the hunters and shepherds got tired of slipping around and they tied spikes to their feet so that they would stick to the ground. And then, well, around 1900 we entered a whole new era. The full-footed crampon if you looked hard enough, you could probably find a para. Of course, Oscar Eckenstein refused to be outdone. He made the 10-point crampon just for fun. Two years later comes Henry Gravel. The Italian mountaineer is everybody's pal. He starts pumping out crampons like they're made in hell. And having a pair is tons of fun, so Lieutenant Tremieux made them adjustable so you'd only need one. Of course, Laurent Crevel, Henry's son, added two front points. Now the game has really begun. People started climbing mountains till the damn things would break. So Amata Crevel decided to raise the stakes, and he made his crampons out of chrome molybdenum. Well, the Gravels had their time and they had their place. But it was Andar Ekelmar that would win the race. His ascent of the Igerwan showed us what these things could do. And it'd be a long, long time before we saw something new. Of course, folks started climbing steeper and steeper ice to the point that something more rigid would be nice. Devon Chenard and Tom Frost were found. And the fully rigid crampon hit the ground. Now this provided the maximum energy between the boot and the crampon and the ice. Well, we had to wait and see what was next. Well, secondary points were the next to come, so when Stubai made them, nobody said they were dumb. Jeff Lowe, well, he wants to join in the game, so he developed a crampon with a real weird name. I mean, who can help but get a pair of foot fangs and become real popular with the cool ice games? In 1985, Salewa commits a crime. They developed a scissor crampon, which, well, that was fine, but they just keep falling off the boots, and I kept losing mine. In 86, we have something completely new. The monopoint crampon enters the stew. Cravel and Moser are selling these puppies, and they're getting eaten up by all of the yuppies. The 90s roll around and the boys need something more to do. Just climbing ice, well that can make you kind of blue. Then one day, one of the boys says, I'm such a dolt, 
Why not I just attach a machine bolt? Now the steep ice was truly the lure, because the boys out west had invented the spur. Spur. The Terminator is the next crampon's name. DMM made something that you couldn't call lame, the anatomically curved crampon, which was anything but tame. And in 2000 came the World Ice Cup with something completely brand new. They bolted the crampon straight to the shoe. Now I'm sure the evolution is going to continue. But uh, ain't nothing beats muscle and sinew. Well, I'm done with my rhyme and it's time to go. I'm sure the crampon will continue, but I got to go. Now if you're just going to do some light mountaineering, you might take a, a boot, something like this. This is a uh, Sportiva. You know, sort of light, um, stiff hiking or uh, light mountaineering boot. But it doesn't have the front um, welts for taking a, 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 stif a stiff cramp on. Um, but it does have the back one. And so, that, you know, it, it limits you on one particular style of cramp on. You know, here's another boot that's a popular mountaineering boot. You know, climbs really well. Um, intended for... You know, uh, Alpine Rock, up to five, whatever. And, uh, they, you know, it works really well, but it doesn't have the front welt. Same as the, this one here. And you get these uh, crampons, and they're generally more for snow walking and, and really light ice work. Um, you know, low angle walking on ice. And they'll have a bale or a, uh, this front piece here where your toe can, your boot can fit into, and then they snap up on the back just the same as the, uh, um, the other crampons. So the finished product kind of looks like this, right? So you can see where the toe piece goes around. And then we were talking on the outside, right? This is where your buckle would be. You want to keep that all nice and clean. And keep the inside clean, no buckles on the inside, all on the outside. And then snaps up. And that's a pretty good walking crampon. I mean, that's, you know, crampons aren't that comfortable to start with, especially if you, you know, do a lot of walking on them. But uh, um, these ones are, you know, as good as they get. And, they'll, and they're light, reasonably light. They don't ball up too badly. And then you can always get these plates that go underneath there. Right. Alrighty, so if you're going the next level down in footwear where you're just using an approach shoe, which is completely flexible, doesn't have a bail in the end, doesn't have a bail in the uh, front, um, you're going to have to go with a fully strap-on crampon. And believe me, you are living in the era. You are living the dream, folks, today, because back in the day, 20, 30 years ago, it was a neoprene nightmare of straps and webbings and you had to weave this thing together like, like a basket maker, you know? It was like a huge puzzle. And the crampons were constantly falling off. But now with the new bail systems where they've, you know, taken the plastics and almost encased the shoe, um, today's, you know, full-on full strap-on crampons will even in, allow you to use something like this, you know, like a shoe, and it just, totally almost totally encases this and you'll get by I mean you can't do any serious work right so just remember that right you got to like anything else I mean in mountaineering right you get the right equipment for the job and understand the limitations of your equipment right and and then if you take and you exceed its limitations be aware that you're exceeding its limitations and what the hazard is and what is going to be the end result Right? Are you going to leave, you know, loved ones behind because your crampon fell off? You went tumbling down the hill and then over the cliff, and then into a pool of water that went into a glacier and then out the toe of the glacier, and there was your body floating around in the lake at the end of the glacier. You don't want that. I don't want that. You don't want that, right? Your your loved ones don't want that. So, just you know, I want you to use caution and uh, and be sensible. Um, one other thing I'd like to add is that if you're, you're getting a mountaineering crampon, just a general purpose mountaineering crampon for light uh, snow and ice work, then be sure to get something that has one of these ball uh, snow removal plates or it keeps the snow from sticking to the uh, bottom of a crampon. This 
is a really major hazard um, and it can't be overestimated like how many people have fallen over and uh, well roped up and taken other people down with them and it's simply from the balling on this on soft snow you know like that snowball snow well that snow is ideal for attaching itself underneath the crampon and then it isn't long before you you know you're walking on uh, four inch platforms and, and then bang, it comes off and bang. And every once in a while, you just get kind of lazy, you get tired of knocking it off, so you want to walk that extra step or two and not have to do that. And the, uh, but it only takes once, like in any of this mountaineering game, right? And uh, she's all over but the crying. So uh, I was out looking the other day at my notes and I saw just about, you know, like these crampons here and a couple other pairs, all the light general mountaineering crampons that are made with really good metals, but very, very light. And then the base plates are so much better because they're built right into the crampon now. And that's what I would do. I wouldn't get a removable base plate. If I was going to altitude, I would get a lightweight general purpose crampon with a, with a built-in base plate for keeping snow from sticking to it. And you'll recognize it either. You know, they're usually colored orange or something for some strange reason. Maybe if you want to, you know, you're lying in the snow upside down in a crevasse, the helicopter can fly over and see those orange discs. I don't know what the purpose of the color is, but they're all that color. Um, and other than that, if you're just mount, you know, ice climbing, waterfall ice climbing, um, and you're just going to buy your equipment for that, well then, I mean, just go down to the climbing shop. You're going to need a full shank boot. You're going to need a, a, a full shank crampon. Um, and that's about that's about it you know there's no like real in between mm -hmm.